serious. And I remember doing a tweet. I remember doing a tweet at that moment and, and saying, look, if we die, Nigeria, you guys take over and continue. That was February 2015. We already, you know, at INEC, when, when, we, put, uh, when we were protesting uh, the no to election postponement. So all of these permutations are things that happen. They will continue to go on. They will tell you that your votes don't count. This, the thing is that if votes don't count, politicians will not be buying votes. The fact that they are buying votes simply says that, you know, uh, votes count. And I think at this moment, the kind of leader, the, isn't, the, the, the usual of, uh, people that have been running for election will run. No doubt about it. And it is their right to run. We cannot tell them not to run. You can't come and start telling somebody, don't run for election. You are told, no. We can't discriminate anybody based on age. So the usual ones we run, and of course, they are the ones that ha they have the money, they can do a, a whole lot of things. But if Nigerians are ready, we can also have the unusual ones running, the ones that we normally don't see, but we will be the ones sponsoring them. We will be the one campaigning for them. We, we, when I say we, I'm talking of we as the people. We be the ones sponsoring their campaign. They being there, and when they get into office, we hold them accountable. And if they do any harm, we simply tell them that don't worry. Next election, you'll be voted out. Or rather, if you're able, able to get the kind of national assembly and and the state houses of assembly that we have, if they do any harm, they know there's impeachment process there. And even those that are there, they can also always be recalled. So I think it is in our hand. What, uh, the, the, the election is going to be. it depends on what is it that Nigerians want it to look like. And one of the things I want to say uh, before I just round up uh, now is uh, it's on the issue of anything is possible. We anything. What I remember October 1st, 2020, I was at a protest. And uh, what was that protest? I think they call it the Five Nigeria Two or something like that. We were protesting about the bad governance and all of that that had been called for. I think it was uh, Rashid and Adem uh, Ade on Jew. Uh, uh, what's his name now? Oh my goodness, Omole uh, Omoye Lesho Were and others that had planned that uh, that did that protest. And I was I was there, and I remember saying to Nigerians that look, Nigerians don't come out to protest. They will pray tweet. They will do all sorts of things, but people are afraid because they, they, they will not come. But guess what? Seven days later, Nigerian youth were on the streets and they stayed on the street for, for two weeks and they did an amaz um, amazing job. They coordinated themselves. They did so well. They did this protest, except for the shameless uh, government uh, of uh, my age that we have that at the end of the day use guns on them instead of doing the, what government uh, is supposed to do, which is uh, the, uh, to protect lives. Uh, and property. So anything, it, it's open, it's open to anyone and anything can happen. And for me, I, I, I'm a very, I'm somebody who is very optimistic at every time. And I also at the same time, I'm pragmatic. I prepare for whatever it is. And if we prepare enough, we can get the kind of leadership that we want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aisha. Um, we're soon going to throw the floor open for other people to ask questions. But I have a battery of a few questions that I will ask you. Uh, one will lead into the other, and then I will leave the floor open for other peoples to, 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 to ask questions. Number one, one of the challenges we have now is that a lot of the votes that are available, you did make an allusion to it, have sort of been paid for, paid for by different kinds of political godfathers. How do we break this? Number two, our great youth, the answers, they seem to have been frightened out of their boldness with what happened in October 20 last year. You know, they've all gone very, very quiet. And I'm thinking that they have been frightened by government and uh, they would no longer maybe have that teeth and that capacity. Even any one of them wants to go out to vote uh, protest now. It is the parents that will be dragged go, don't go. So somehow government has used its might and its power and its guns to silence these people. I want to know what you think about that. And as a throwback to that, even government is saying to people like yourself and myself that we should shut up, we shouldn't talk, that if we talk, they will deal with us, they will do this and that. And I seem to hear that all the time. I had Father Mbaka speaking very, very um, aggressively a couple of days ago on the, this thing that how can people tell me not to talk and so on and so forth. And he was really, really strong about it. But that's what we have from government today. In fact, some even look at it as acts of disloyalty 
and blah, blah, blah. The third one is, why is it, uh, you said one of the reasons why you came out in 2015 was that you thought the president would delegate to the vice president who you, who you think is a much more, well, much more capable person. Let me use that word. Why hasn't that happened? Now, what happened? Why, why are we having a situation where that's what you thought or what a lot of people thought didn't quite happen? Um, I think those four questions, and then two more. Uh, you, are you going to run in 2023 or what role are you going to play? And then finally, what are your thoughts on the states of our national security? You know, we're having all these security challenges everywhere. Who is behind it? Because that's really the, the topic we're talking about, security and national development. What's happening to our security? Why are we going through all these challenges with security? And what do we do about it? And how is it affecting our national development? I wonder if you can speak to those questions and then I will maintain my peace. You want me to repeat them or you remember? No, all no, of no, them? no. I've, I've, I've got them. I'm writing them down. Okay, <laughs> so I'll take you on. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor, uh, for that. So I think I will start uh, from the from the beginning. Okay, let me talk about it. You talk about a lot of votes being paid for, and then how do we uh, break that? So it's part of the things that, that I did uh, talk about. Yes, votes are being bought. But these votes are being bought not from ghosts, not from spirits, but from human beings that live uh, amongst us. And every one of us, we have access to those people whose votes are being bought. That, that, that's one. And so, for example, that's where I talk about the circle of influence. Are we using our circle of influence? If, for example, uh, you know, looking at the people, the staff who are working with me, uh, looking at the people that I come in contact with all the time, looking at my, my village people, my aunties, my, you know, some of them are educated, they don't understand what is going on. Am I speaking to them? Am I talking to them? Are we all talking to them? Because if we expand all our circle of influence, I begin to talk to the people that we interact with them, let them understand the relationship between their votes and what uh, uh, and what it means when they sell it, because most of them don't understand. And also when they are coming to you and seeking for you, I mean, for me personally, in 2019, I, I made I, I made a decision that uh, I will no longer be stopgap for people who refuse to hold their, their government accountable. If, for example, you sell your vote to a politician, there's no power you're coming to me to come and ask me to pay your child school fee that I will look for you. I will not. And I will not be emotionally moved. Emotionally, emotional blackmail will not move me. So you sold your vote. I will send you back to that politician. I tell you, go and meet the police because that's where your, your this thing is. So there is a tough love that must happen. And if we have to begin to put it together, because at the end of the day, when they sell, the, when votes are sold and you put in incompetent people, it affects even the, the, the earnings that we get. I'm a businesswoman. In the last few years, my, my business has terribly been, 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 been affected. And of course, so if you are giving me more responsibility, more problem that I have to handle, because people call you in the middle of the night, people call you at 2 a.m. to come and tell you they've not eaten. You have to start, uh, before oh, I will be running up and that health has get out, whatever. First of all, what have you done to hold your government, first of all, accountable before that? So we must begin to utilize this stuff. Love. We must begin to let people know. We must begin to talk to people, all the people around us. What are we saying? Because they also look to us. They also take their cue from, or from, from, from us that they sort of like look up to. But the thing is that we don't even use those powers. We don't even know we have those powers. So we just left them for politicians to to come and meet them and talk to them uh, anyhow and, and just do what, what, they, what they want to do. So that's one. The second thing also is the fact that people aren't voting. People aren't go. There's too much apathy, and most especially from the elite. There's a missing elite in Nigeria, an elite that thinks that as long as they are okay, all is okay. As long as they can afford the good things in life, all right, they don't care about government, whoever gets into office. And that's dawning on us now that that is not a, that is not a, 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 a good way to go. And so if people come out and mass and come out to vote, the issue of buying votes will be reduced. 
I mean, I know you can't campaign during a during a, a poll uh, uh, when the polling process is going on uh, at the polling unit. But of course, people see other people, and if anybody comes, because I can't be at the whatever polling unit I am at, nobody is going to come and buy food, and I'm going to keep quiet. It not go happen. Let me even enter my so kind of language. Anybody understand? It will happen. So if, for example, people are coming to come and buy, because what they now do is that they will do a uh, vote and show. It's before that they normally will give the money because they, they realize that some people will collect money and vote for that choice. So they will ask you to vote and show. If you're there, you won't allow I won't allow that to happen. I know there are a lot of people who will not allow that to happen, but then we need to be at the polling unit. So more people need to register, more people need to vote. If you all go out and vote, it is even how many votes can the politicians buy? They can't buy many votes. They don't have the money. There is no Nigerian politician that have the money to actually buy all of the uh, uh, votes if we go there. But the thing is that many people do not come. They do not even come to vote. A lot of people register to get their card because it's the cheapest means of identification that you have. If you're, if you're going to use your uh, uh, driver's license, it's expensive to get. If you're going to use your your uh, international passport is expensive to get, but with your voting card, you can get it. It's cheap, it's free, you get it. So when they do that, their names are on the register, but they don't come. And on the on the day of election, the electoral body will send in the, the registered amount of registered voters, uh, you know, the, uh, the, what do you call it now? The voting, what is it called? Sheets to, 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 to the place. And so if you don't come, those papers are there and they are vulnerable to be used. That's why you now see them turn printed because people don't go. So if people come out, how many can politicians, but they can't buy a lot. They only buy few and that few is what makes difference. So we need to come out more to be able to mitigate that issue of the, the rigging of where they turn print uh, 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 the ballot papers and also the issue of buying because they won't have enough money to be able to buy uh, uh, everyone off. And so that that's one thing. And so for me, I think on the issue of the uh, of the vote, we need to do that. There's a need for a lot of education, education, uh, education that needs to go on. And that's the way I talked about people going out to to educate other people. Don't just wait and say that, oh, okay, because people have not got into school. Yes, we know democracy. You need high literacy. You need educated people. But even where people that are not educated, come to their level. And I say to people, when you're talking to them, when you're educating them, you should not be patronizing. You should not come from a condescending point of view. Come and sit down on the floor. If it's a woman that is selling uh, akara or roasting corn, look for, there's a way we sit where you actually put your, uh, your, 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 what do you call it now, your shoe on the ground and sit on it and sit and sit down. Sit down and have a conversation with her. Tell her the relationship between her job this this work she's doing and suffering, and she's sending her child to 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 university, and the child will come out if she if if there's no good government there. If you don't put the right people that will make the economy to expand, and there will be job, your child will come out and there will be no job. They'll be telling you to go and look for one senator or one uh, house of rep member to sign for your child. Meanwhile, you don't have access to these people. It's just letting people understand. That's why where I talked earlier about religion, where religious ru uh, rulers are now twisting the issue. They'll be telling you it's your enemy that is tying your child's progress. It's your village people and all of that. No, it's simply economics. That's the reason why the child is not getting the job. So when you explain to this person, there's always this aha moment that happens. There's a paradigm shift. And you know, there's always that, oh, wow. So this is what it is. I didn't understand. So now, so it be kind of moments that happen. And these are the things that every one of us, we should all be doing. We should all be going out of there. We must be advocates for democracy, advocates for voting rights, advocates for good governance. Be out there. Those who are giving us bad governance, they are not going to relent. They don't get tired. They have money. They have your money that they use. They have all of that. And so if they aren't getting tired, we must never find ourselves in any situation whereby we are getting tired. We must keep going, keep going, keep going, and also talking to people and, and doing so much. On the issue of uh, NSAS, uh, we all watch the heinous uh, 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 killing that happened on, on, on October 20th, 2020. And it's, it's really sad. But I, I must say that the ENSAS protesters, they are out there. The biggest thing that ENSAS did was that it emancipated the people. The, the, you know, there was this, 
You know, mental captivity is worse than physical captivity. A lot of people have been in bondage, they're in mental captivity. They don't even know that they have a right. But now a lot of people are more aware and they're more out there. And I think it's, and they're doing so many things. There are so many things that are being done. Even though, yes, they might now have come together in the place that it's being held loud and clear, but they're doing so many things, so many awareness being created, so many things that are working. You know, when sometimes we see things, we see like, what they call, for example, in business, what people call overnight success, it's usually a lot of work that was done behind the skin, which is the scene, which is working, working towards it. And then one day people just see that and like, ah, this thing just happened. No, it didn't just happen. People are working towards it. And I would say that a lot of young Nigerians, uh, uh, the, the Nigerian youth, the NSAS protesters who are doing so many things, the leaders among uh, those protests. For me, I mean, all in all, all of what they are doing and for the, I will forever be indebted. But I think one of the things that I want my generation and probably the ones older and all of that for us to take is that fixing Nigeria is not an NSAS thing. NSAS was not about fixing Nigeria. NSAS was about stopping police brutality. And you know, and one of the things, NSAS protest was a protest of survivor. The youth that were constantly being killed finally came out and said, stop killing us. And instead of the government to actually say, okay, we'll work on, we'll stop killing you, they actually kill them the more. So I think it's not be fair for us to just leave the burden of fixing Nigeria to the Nigerian youth because they didn't cause a problem. I, my generation also didn't cause this problem. The generation before me, this problem has been caused everyone and every one of us has been adding. Every one of us has been adding to that problem and passing it on to the next generation. And I think when the solving of the problem, uh, to solve the problem, I, I wouldn't want it to be just NSA. It's every one of us. Even when NSA protesters were on the street, Nigerians should have come out. Where are the, where are the uh, uh, what do you call them now, professional bodies? Where are the trade unions? Where is the student union? These are things that have helped in ensuring that democracy it's, it's well grounded and those in position, they do not uh, go to the places of uh, going on with impunity, but all of these things didn't happen. So I think it is not be, it will not be fair for the Nigerian youth for us to expect them to be the ones to clean the mess that we have contributed in making for them. The Nigerian youth, like every other youth uh, around the world, should have had a nation where they are thriving, where they, they can develop, they can do things. Um, amongst all the things that were happening, they found niches for themselves where they were thriving. It's despite the kind of nation they were dealt with. And then yet we came after them, uh, killing them, uh, profiling them, maiming them, doing all sorts of uh, atrocities to them uh, via the police. And I think, uh, so it's, it's important that every one of us, we must uh, go towards that. But I must say that, you know, uh, they are really doing so many things. And I think every one of us coming together and doing all we can will actually go a long way. One of the things that I want Nigerians to understand is the power is in our hands. The power is in our hands and we can. And let me also say something. There is no region. I said this thing in, before 2015 election, and I am repeating it again. There is no region in Nigeria that determines who becomes president. There's no one region. So all of this thing of thinking, oh, is the North, is the South, no, no region. For, for, every, for anybody to emerge as president, more than two or three regions must come together and align behind that person for so let us take that and let people not sit down and be afraid that oh some people say they have numbers they have the numbers nobody has the numbers every one of us we all we all need each other especially with the kind of vote and it, it, uh, like i said in 2014 with the emergence i was born and brought up in the north i'm the child of the south so for me i can look at either region dispassionately i don't i don't owe any allegiance to the north or to the south i'm in nigeria period and that's it and i say to people with the imagine with the middle belt the uh, north central it is no longer what it used to be where you say that oh the the north the north have all the numbers and whatever no because you have a, a north central there with uh, th that somehow doesn't feel at, feel at home even within within the north and i always say to people even when people are saying they want to restructure they say look the thing is about being pragmatic the thing is about just ensuring that you do the needful for example, today, if you're talking about restructuring, as people from the South, South want restructuring, people from the South, East want restructuring, they want a breakaway, people from the Southwest want restructuring, they want breakaway, people from the North Central, they want restructuring, they want to break away. Why don't you come together and work towards it? 
Why don't you get people into the legislative arm of government? What are your representatives doing? You can actually make the law. You need to tell. Yes, work on the to tell and get it. You need, there are certain things that you need simple majority. Work on that simple majority uh, and get it. And so the issue is that it's just that people don't want to work because it's the hard way to do it. Nothing good comes easy. I think I was, who was the person that sung? Is it Bongos? I think there's a remix now that uh, that uh, Two-Face has, has done with him. He said, nothing goes, good comes easy. So we must understand that people must know that they must be out there, dead boots on the ground, hands, hands in the mud, everything. You must get yourself dirty in getting a great nation. We can't just sit down and be and be sitting down and just go and go and pray. When we pray, we now be sitting and waiting on God to do for us what He has given us the capacity to do for ourselves. Like I always say to people, if you like, pray from today to daiki.com. Go and stay inside your room. Close your door and pray. Fast for seven years if you like. Pray 20 times a day. Do whatever you want to do. Cast and by do whatever you want to do. If you are, if you do not go out to get what you are, you say you are looking for jollof rice and that you want gel, a plate of jollof rice in front of your table, keep fasting, keep praying, keep keep do whatever you want to do. That jollof rice will not come out. The only way to come out is that you leave that room, you will enter the kitchen and either prepare jollof rice or with the money you have, call somebody to bring jollof rice for you. So this is also the same thing with nation building. This issue of being to pray for Nigeria, pray for this, pray for that. I mean, it's not going to work. It's not going to work because God has given us everything that we need to be a great nation. We have the mineral resources. We have the people. We have whatever it takes to be that great nation. And so it's left for us whether we want to do it uh, or, or not to do it. And so so the next thing, of course, the, the next question came about, uh, you know, si the government also silencing the people and keeping the, the uh, people uh, quiet. We, we have a young man for the last two years, Dadiata. Dadiata was taken away in 2019. Uh, um, I think that was September, August, August 1st. It was taken away and it's been over two years and nothing. And what was the crime of Dadiata? He simply spoke against bad governance, against injustice and all of that. And he was, and he was disappeared. That's the way. And there are a lot of people who are languishing in different jail, jails today, different cells, just because they spoke out. And they, there are so many people, of course, who are being told all the time that they shouldn't speak. Uh, some time ago, my mom called me and she knows she was crying. Please, you know, people are always calling them and everything. And my mom was saying to me, please, she doesn't want to lose her first child. She doesn't want to lose. And I said to my mom, I would rather you lose your first child than me lose my first child. Because I'm, I am my mom's first child. So I'm ready to die rather than my child. Because if we keep keeping quiet, nothing is going to change. And the only reason why they can pick one or two people is because there are other people amongst who are telling us to keep quiet. I got to a place, I said, people, please don't call me and tell me, oh, I shall be afraid of you. Leave them, let them not kill you. Don't. Don't tell me that. Because you're not doing me, you're not doing a favor. You, by doing that, you, 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 you're aligning with the oppressors. So what if I get killed? Do you think it's only when I speak out that I'm going to get killed? I see people, we are all born to that. I see people when they are coming, oh, are you not afraid? The other time there was anonymous, this, oh, you know, they are, they put it, they are going to kill you, we are going to. See, we are all dead in Nigeria. Nobody is alive. Anybody that thinks being in Nigeria, that they are alive, the thing surprises me. We are all dead. That what we are having is not life, it's not living. We are merely existing. So I don't want a life where I'll be merely existing, where I'll be afraid, where I will not speak. The victim card is already going around in Nigeria. We are all victims to waiting to happen. Being a victim in Nigeria is no longer a matter of if, it is a matter of when, when is it your turn? Because yesterday's victims were once survivors. Today's victims were yesterday's survivors and tomorrow's victims will be today's survivors. Who are the today's survivors? It's you and I. Those who have been killed before will not be killed again. The next to be killed are those of us who are alive. The question always is who is next? So if I say I won't keep quiet because I am afraid uh, of government coming to kill me, because government in, uh, uh, is, uh, incompetence is already killing me. Corruption is already, already killing me. There are, doctors are currently been on strike for how long now in Nigeria? There are people who cannot afford private care who have died because doctors are on strike. And the government, the gov and why are doctors on strike? The government hasn't done what it is supposed to do. 
So the thing is that when people come out and be telling you that, oh, you know, are you not afraid to die? Are you not this? A lot of people call my husband. Oh, please, how are you allowing me to do this? Why is that? I remember in 2014, there was, we went for a, a particular hour. I had a business meeting and my husband came with me and I, I met the uh, representative of the company that I distribute for. And the person was said to my husband, ha, ah, why are you allowing your wife to come out and do that? He just, uh, and all of that, you know, after this, and my husband just simply said something to him. My husband said to him, if your daughter was amongst these school children that have been taken away, will you want my wife to speak for your daughter? And the man was quiet. So it's, it's that we can't say and say, we will not talk. This death we are going to die. I said, I said look, COVID-19 happened. The whole world was shut down for how many months? And people are still afraid of death. People are dying every day. So people are dying from corruption. There's an accident that happens on a road that, that the money has been paid for it to be dualized, but it was only dualized on paper. Portholes are there and an accident happens and people die. It is not witches and wizards that, are, that, that it is not witches and wizards that wanted to drink blood and went to cause that accident. That the way they would always say, oh, accident will not be your portion. How will accident be your portion? When your, your people are stealing money, the money they're supposed to use on wood and we are not fixing it. And somebody is telling you accident will not be your, or your, your portion or our portion. So when somebody dies, that is corruption already killing the person. Somebody goes to, has gone to hospital. There's a lady who has cancer. She went to hospital. The doctors said to her, oh, uh, uh, this thing, uh, doctors are on strike. Hold on. She's supposed to start uh, her, uh, her treatment, and they are telling her to hold on. Will the cancer hold on? Will it not go beyond her breast and into her body? Isn't this bad governance already killing every one of us? So the people that have died before, are, am I better than them? I'm, I'm, at the, my end, I'm, at this end, it's not a final place for us. So when people talk about, oh, the father, oh, don't speak, they're trying to silence, they will do that. And I think uh, the thing is that more people need to speak. And that's the reason why I say Nigeria does not need more activists. Nigeria needs more active citizens. People must, un because we have a mentality where people are contracting out their fight and their sayings and their responsibility. So they feel that, oh, there are certain activists that should speak for that. If this one is the job of activists now. No, it's not the job of activists. It's the job of every one of us. Eternal vigilance is the price you pay for democracy. You can't vote people into it and assume that they are going to know what to do and do it well. No, it's not going to happen. They are not going to know what to do because they are your employees. You don't employ people and go away and, and be sleepy. You employ people and look, check what they're doing, tell them what they're doing, and ensure that they're doing the right thing. And if they are not doing the right thing, you fire them. Simple. No, not two ways about it. Anybody that doesn't do that in their business, well, you know what's happening. Everybody will be corrupted and nobody will be doing the right work and you have a business that will collapse just like we have a Nigeria that has collapsed. So there are no particular people who are supposed to be speaking. Every one of us is supposed to be speaking. And the more we speak, the more we are out there, the government will be afraid. Even the security agencies that are being used by the government, because we have a nation where the security agencies, their allegiance is to the uh, president and the ruling party and not to Nigeria and Nigerians. So by the time they see more people are speaking, by the time they see more people on the streets, by the time they see, yes, we are speaking, even those security agents will join us. I know the number of protests you go to and the police are saying to you, you know, we are with you, but we're only doing our job. When they see that number, they will. For everything that comes, there's a critical mass that needs to come out. At least in a protest, about one to two percent of, 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 the, of the citizens, they need to be out there making the mass. People cannot just sit. But then when you are talking about when there's one uh, religious gathering now, you will see millions of people. They are all out there. They will be there. They will be. Uh, they will be praying, 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 so that God will come and do for them. Hey, well, meanwhile, what God has said we should do, we are not doing that. But anyway, that's the point. So let me go back to the next uh, question uh, on the issue of uh, of Sibanjo. Like I said, for me personally, and I don't know whether I'm speaking for anybody. For me, Buhari is not my disappointment because Buhari, I, I never, I, I never, never, never. Even in 2014, and which I have a tweet out there. I actually said that he cannot win election after all, right from 1984 and also what happened in 2011. And but then, and this is my own opinion that I stand by. So it has nothing to do with this program. This is me speaking on myself as Aisha Yusufu, and I'm always ready. Anybody has any issue with what I've said, come to me, not the organizers of, of, this, of, this, uh, of this particular uh, program. 
And, and for me, uh, like I said, 20, after 2011 uh, riots, and he didn't do anything to, to stop it. Yes, um, and I wasn't saying that he started it, but he should have done something actively to stop it, which he never did. I felt politically he was dead. But then there's a situation whereby somebody will feel so badly that you, you will not make somebody something that is not palatable to actually be palatable. That was what happened in 2015. And in 2015, I was saying, Buhari did not win the 2015 election. Jonathan lost the 2015 election. It was his to win. How can somebody that you had beaten hands down before, then you now come and be down, that had been losing, you now come and lose to him because of, you know, you got to a place of bad governance, uh, 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 incompetence and arrogance and impunity and all of that. But that's not the, the main reason why we are here uh, uh, anyway. But one of the things I think we need to take away, which people are not seeing that, in 2020, in 2021 now, we are making the same mistake, thinking that things cannot be worse than what you currently have. That was what people thought in 2015, that things cannot be worse. Things can actually be worse. And if we don't do the needful, people might say, God forbid. I me, mean, I don't use God forbid uh, anyhow, because God will not forbid what we have refused to forbid for ourselves. If people do not do the needful, by 2025, we'll be looking back and saying that this Bukhari's era we even be better. And so citizens must understand the need for them to do the needful, the need for them to keep leaders uh, accountable. So when uh, the by the time 2015 uh, came, election, and I saw uh, an uh, Osibajo that was out there, a running mate, who didn't wait to be the one to be told anything. He was out there doing all sorts of things, running and actually doing meeting the people, doing election, you know, campaigning in a totally different manner. And so for us, okay, and seeing what he had done, his antecedent, what he had done in Lagos State and, and all of that. And for me, I was like, okay, well, this could be something. Let's see how it goes. And of course, I they see a lot of people who say, oh, why didn't you look at the antecedent of Buhari? Why didn't you say, I say, I, have, I did. He delegates. Even up to now, he delegates. He's not the one. He doesn't do anything. Other people do it. But the thing is that I thought this particular vice president was the one that would be able to, 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 to do it and be able to have that this day. So in saying that, okay, what are the things that could have widened it or say about George? Well, that would be, first of all, I think there's this thing about, you know, people who have gone through places, you know, being taken on. For example, uh, Tinibu has been the one, all those like, the Osibajo have been taken, put in places and grown all, all over the years. And then they come in now. Maybe he's like looking at biding his time or one thing or the other. This is, uh, I, I don't have facts about this. And sort of like waiting to play the good one. The good one, instead of taking leadership role and actually doing something. And one of the things I always want us never to forget is that I don't think there's any vice president that has been able to act in the capacity of acting president more than Osibajo. And most of the times he was acting president, he really wasn't doing anything except for one time when uh, the DSS had invaded the National Assembly. And that was the last time, if anybody noticed, that was the last time that he ever became acting president. When the, the DSS had invaded the National Assembly and then uh, uh, he sacked the head of the DSS. Since then, Buhari had never given him transmitted power to him to be acting uh, president, except if I'm mistaken, but from my own observation, he, he, he had it. Every other time, it was all he was doing uh, these good speeches, uh, uh, motivational speaker, going from one place to the other. That's not what we, we voted you for. We voted you for you to be able to make hard decisions, to take to take hard stands and do things. I remember in 2017, I did a video where I said the acting president thing was not working that Buhari needs to resign. And a lot of people said they were going to kill me. I had death threats and, and everything over, over that video. But I was simply saying the fact, they weren't working. People were, I say, it's not working. If you even saw, remember when the, the then Minister of State uh, Petroleum, uh, I think it was Kachuku, Ibe Kachuku, Dr. Ibe Kachuku, would wait to get, it was a letter he wrote or something to the president and all of that, things that were happening while the Osibanjo was acting president, but it wasn't brought to them. And I said to people, you see what I was telling you, these things weren't working because everything were practically at a standstill. Why Professor Yemi Osibanjo decided to take that stand, I don't know, because I don't see any reason why you can be acting president, even if it's for one day and you don't actively change the things that are happening uh, uh, in, in your country. I mean, how can you get power for even 24 hours and you don't put your name in a place where hundreds of years from now, people will look at and say, ah, thank God this person was, 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 was in office. Is it just to be in office for you to get siren, for you to get money, for you to get enjoyment and whatever? No, that shouldn't be a reason why people uh, are, are working to, towards getting in, into office. So 
honestly, for a, a, a good number of us, that was it. And one of the things that I also want to add, and I think I'll add you guys about that, the first attack on the civic space, the first attack on the civil space actually happened happened when Os Yemi Osibajo was the acting president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. That was in 2017, when they started attacking people at the nation, at the Unity Fountain. I was there on that day. They sent in police, and it was the Kaduna, it was uh, Southern Kaduna people that were protesting the killings of their people. I was part of that protest, and the police came in and started attacking. And that's when they tried to, they started shutting down the Unity Fountain, bringing in soldiers. Uh, sorry, bringing in police to come and stay there and stop people from coming in, even as bring back, uh, we refused to. That was when they attacked the Shia press uh, people who were actually sitting uh, at the Unity Fountain and forced them to go on the street. We, the members of the Bring Back Our Press Movement, we refused to allow ourselves to be driven away from that. And we kept shouting that the civic space was under attack, but Nigerians did nothing because we're a nation of people who, as long as the matter does not concern them, they will not, they will not bother, even when people are, are being killed. So when I saw people being surprised that uh, the, the, the Nigerian government, Buhari's government, killed people at the at Lekki Toll Gate, I'm like, why are you surprised? They did that to Shia in December 2015. They killed a lot of people. They've been killing Shia protesters on the street. They have been killing BF, uh, IPO protesters uh, on the street. So why are we acting surprised as if, oh, this thing? So many people, when things happen, are you? No, okay, when, sorry about that. I thought my daughter wanted to speak with me. When things happen to other people, they, they, they keep quiet, maybe, oh, because they don't like those people. In fight for justice, in fight for human rights, it doesn't matter whether you like somebody or you do not like somebody. It doesn't matter whether you like their choices or you don't like their choices. It doesn't matter whether you like their way of life or you don't like their way of life. What matters is their human rights and, and their, 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 the justice that they, they need to get. And that is what is most important. And until we get to that point where if anybody is taught, any one of us is, all of us is taught, all of us come out and speak on the issue, they will continue to pick one after the other and take us away because they know at the end of the day, nobody is going to, uh, to say anything. So I just needed to put that. So for me personally, I'm never going to look at anybody's VP and vote anybody based on the vice uh, president. And also let me add this thing before I, I forget. I see, uh, there was even a time I tweeted it. I said, look, the, see, the, see what uh, Yemi Osibajo was able to do with the uh, Lagos uh, legal system and, and all of that uh, as commissioner over, over there. And I look at if Buhari can become the minister of petroleum, why can't Osibajo also become the minister of justice and the AGF attached to his vice president? I see him, if he was there, the, the, a lot of improvement that probably would have gotten in, 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 in our judiciary uh, system, that would have been something else. Huh? Okay, sorry, please. Mommy's duty. Huh? Okay. <laughs> love you. Right. Bye. Love you. Stay safe. May Allah bless and protect you. Okay. Oh, so sorry about that. My daughter is going somewhere, so she needed to just uh, inform me. I, I needed to do that. So imagine he was there and then he he went, uh, he was working on, on adding that. So if we have a president that is also uh, minister of petroleum. So we can also have a vice president that is also uh, minister, uh, 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 minister of what's the AGF and also minister of justice and, and, and all of that. So back to the question on, are you going to run? No, I'm not, absolutely not. And so there's the, the reasons why, and I'm going to make uh, that uh, very clear. I am one person. I don't do things just for the fun of doing them. I don't do things just because, okay, it's the thing or people think, no. For me, in everything that I want to do, I always ensure that it is something that I want to do on my own. It's something that I am prepared to do on my own. And it's something that, you know, I, I know. And when I do that, I give it my all. I don't look back. That's why nobody heard about Aisha Yusufu before 2014, 2014. I, I wasn't ready to speak. I had the mouth. I can talk oh, in my, within my sphere, even in my university. I remember in my university days, a lot of people would refuse to stand with me at the staff area because they say, ah, Aisha, you put somebody in trouble. Ah, if, whether it's lecturer or whatever, I don't care. If you like, drive me from the school. I'll fight for my right. But I never spoke on national issues because I needed to first of all focus on my financial independence. So I'm, the, I'm that kind of person who, whatever it is I do, I'm ensure I am prepared for it. 
and I'm doing it because I want to know because of anything. And so when I get into it, I give it my all. That's why I always say to people, the first thing I put my mouth on a national issue, you heard me loud and clear. I wasn't waiting for anybody to give me a seat at the table. I wasn't waiting for anybody to want to hear my, I spoke whether they want to hear my voice or not. And for me, that's, if I ever decide I'm going to run into a for, for election, I'm going to be there, out there, I'll be in your face. I'll be in your face campaign. If you like, say you don't, you, you don't like me, you don't like whatever, it's none of my business. I will be there, I will be campaign until you are sick and tired of hearing me campaign every day, whatever number of years it takes. And then you say, look, this woman, come and take this, let's see what you do and, and whatever. So I am always somebody who is deliberate about the things I do. For now, absolutely not. And I say to people, because for, at, at this moment, I'm not ready to give the sacrifice that is needed to give that good quality leadership. And I also do not have the competence that is required, the full competence and knowledge that is required to actually give the kind of leadership in whatever capacity that is out there. So I'm somebody who, I'm a very, I'm very truthful with myself. I check myself out and all of that. But one of the things I say to people is the fact that in 2031, right now, and I've put the next 10 years of my life, I'm focusing on self-development. There are so many things I know I don't know that I'm going to be working on, reading on, uh, going to, uh, learning about them and, and hands-on experience. Because Nigeria does not, Nigeria at the stage that we are in, now, there are many people who are competent. We should look for this, whether we like them or we don't like them. As long as they are good and they can do the work, let's put them there. It is not a love affair that we are looking for. It is a citizen uh, citizen and people in office relationship. It's not love. So we should get the, those kind of people that, that, we, that we run there. For me, I do not think what Nigeria needs is a leader who already knows what it is, what it takes, whether in the capacity of as president, governor, or national assembly member, people who know what it already takes, not people who will go there and start learning on the job. I will never be one to go to a place and start learning on the job because I don't want to be in office. What am I being in office for? For me to buy my first car, for me to build my first house, for me to send my children to university abroad or for me to do what? I've already done that. So if I ever get to office, I want a situation where by a hundred years from now, people will sit back and say, ah, Aisha Yusufu. She was, she was once so, so, so of Nigeria and we thank God for that. I don't want to be in an office where it's all about siren and everything. And when the siren is gone, you look at your four years in office, eight years in office or whatever it is, or 15 years or 12 years. Some people have been in National Assembly since the year 1999 and they've contributed practically zero, nothing to national uh, de development. So for me, it's all about uh, competence. And right now, honestly, I do. I see people are like, oh, come on, run for president. I'm like, oh. You people think president is boy much. I don't have the capacity to do that, but I'm working on myself probably in 10 years. And also most importantly, I don't want to sacrifice. I have a young family. I am not that young anyway. My youngest child is going to be 20, but I'm still, I'm very much involved in my children's life. Uh, graduated from university. My son is dyslexic. Uh, what he went, we went through, you know, especially he had to come to England at the age of 14 because there were no schools to be able to take care of his, uh, of his, uh, uh, educational needs. Dyslexia, for those of you who do not know, is a learning disability and it just not only affects your schooling learning, it has also affects your, your way in life. And I'm a very involved mom. So I, I don't have time. Uh, for example, uh, I think by the second of next month, I would have spent two months in England. I've been in England for this long. Just come here. I'm staying here with my with my kids just to get my son settled. My daughter also, that's the one that just came to hug me and left. Now, that's, that was my youngest child. And just to get them settled. And if I, I'm a public servant, I can't do that. I can't just come and stay in a place for two months. Even the president, he goes out for one week, we're already shouting on him. So for me, I don't want to be accountable to anybody for my, especially for my time. And so at this moment, it's something that I am not uh, ready uh, to do. So that, on that question, no, I'm not running, I'm not running for 2023 uh, uh, election. But on my own case, Okay, thank I'm you very to, much. Okay, yeah, so because the question I a bit long, I haven't got to the one of security. So I will just uh, quickly, uh, uh, round up uh, on that, but I'll need to speak on the one of uh, security because that's the main uh, this thing here. So what I'm for me, what I'm going to do is to ensure that I'm looking out for who are the candidates, who are competent candidates. For me, anybody, I don't even know when we get to that place when with the final candidates are known. 
anybody, I can be on anybody's team. As long as the person has competence, character, capacity, the person has courage, the person is patriotic, and I know the person is going to put Nigeria first. That's what matters to me. I'm going to, if uh, by the grace of God, inshallah, um, if that's if God, as a Muslim, we, everything, when we talk about the future, we have to put inshallah, because we don't know whether we are going to live to, to see be, uh, to see that time. Mine is, and it was the same thing I did with the 2019 election. I'm going to put my, my body, soul, and my finances. I put my money in the 2015, I donated to a candidate, I donated the highest amount that, that, that can be the highest physical amount that can be donated, one million naira. I put in other resources and everything, and I'm still going to do that again in 2023. Uh, and it doesn't matter. I'm not interested in any party. I'm interested in the candidate. And like I did in my, for my 2019 uh, election, I voted a different party for president, House of Rep member, and also for uh, the Senate. I live in Abuja, we don't have a governor. That's the same way I'm going to go. So it is not about who, which party or, or whatever it is. So come back to the last question, because there were quite a lot of questions that we, that we asked. Coming back to the last question on the issue of uh, insecurity. I think when people say, what is, people are expecting that there is one person or one thing that is be behind the insecurity in Nigeria. And I think that's, I don't know how to put it. That's, for me, that's a wrong way of viewing it. So let's let's come back. So because we want to see, oh, is this person that is causing it? Is that person? We're making all of these accusations, allegations, conspiracy theories, and all of that. The thing is that the Nigerian system has been wired to breed people who are going to be terrorists, who are going to be criminals, who are going to be whatever it is. But then I will take us through these examples. I grew up in Kwanahudu, in Kano. And where I grew up, it was the, it, I call it the Ajeguli of Kano. It was poverty stack. It was people who were on drugs. More than 70% of the youth at that time were on drugs. The other time, myself and my brother, we were trying to calculate, we were trying to count the number of graduates from that part. And this is a huge place for those who have who know Kano. And we could get, I think, up to 15 graduates. Or so we could barely get up to 15 graduates. And out of those 15 graduates, my father produced four, sorry, produced seven. Because myself and my sibling, we are seven, and all of us are graduates. So this is a place where people, some children were sent away from their houses at the early age of three, four, five. Some, some as early as two, they became street children, al -Majiri. You see a child who has spent a year or two years without showering, to the extent that on their skin, there will be something like a greenish growth that they, we call, they call it kanzua in Hausa that happens on their skin. These are children who were sent to Malans to go and get education. Of course, the Malans didn't care about them. They were out there, they, were, they had nothing. They didn't finish the Quran, uh, the, the, other, the Quran they sent them to learn. They didn't go to school. They didn't learn a trade. They had nothing. They were on drugs and they, could, they don't have nothing. And so you will see some of them will come and meet you and say, please, can you borrow me some money? The next riot, I will pay you. People borrowed money, youth borrowed money for the next riot. And these are people who were looked upon as dregs of the society, who nobody cared of. They had seen human beings at their worst. The only time that people looked at them with respect and fear was when they had a weapon in their hands. So riots. Since 1990, I finished secondary school in 1991. By 1990, riots had started. 1990, there was a huge riot that happened in 1991 in Kano. Many people in my, the area I lived in were killed. There are many places, I'm a Muslim, but when these riots come, nobody cares whether I'm a Muslim or not because I'm from Edo State. So they see me as a non-Muslim. And my people, a lot of my people were affected because those who are, who, the, the, the Christians, when the fight happens, are killing me because they think I'm a Muslim. The Muslims are killing me because I'm not from, from, from that region. So it's, it's a lose-lose situation for, for, for some of us. And so, up till now, nobody is looking at this issue and our insecurity. And so these people who had no life, except when they held the weapon, who had no job, who have no access to money. I say to people, when you see people coming to kill, they are not killing you because of your religion. They're not killing you because oh, you, are, you are not Muslim. They are killing you because of the economy you have. After all, when you go to the places, it is where you see the fine cars. It's who owns the cars, who owns the buildings, who owns whatever. And so when uh, insecurity, all of these things started in the northern part of the, the country, many of them now found a place where they can actually be people. They can actually grow. It got to a state where we we're heading, even from Boko Haram, that if you if you kill your parents or you kill this, you, you get certain kind of promotion. But we are still not talking about this. We're not talking about the issue of the lack of education, the issue of overpopulation, 
People marry wives that and give back to children that they cannot take care of. They put these children on the streets. These children have nothing. These children are turning to, to crime and all of that. And these are major problems that we are having. Kidnapping, when kidnapping shout started in Nigeria, I knew I used to shout. I was saying no, because I read a lot about kidnapping. The United States went was was on its knees because of kidnapping. There were heinous kidnappings that were happening in the in the in the in New York as far back 1930 something and all of that. There was a prominent family whose child was taken away and never brought. And sometimes what they would do, they would even cut the parts of the person they have and send it to you in post. So when the kidnapping started and, and expatriates were being kidnapped in the South Side, I was like, no, this should be. Many people thought it was a good day. Hey, it's not only your Yubo they are kidnapped. But when they are done with the Oyubos, what will happen? And so today we see where we are today. We have forgotten that there's lack of education. A lot of people are out, they don't, they don't have any future. There is unemployment. There is, uh, there is no rule of law. And there is no peace and there's no justice. When there's no justice, in insecurity will be high. And uh, resources are being mismanaged. And all of these things have contributed to the insecurity that we have. And if we look at development, of course, there can be development when there's insecurity. Because economically, it affects everything. Businesses are not going to be, be, be coming in. Businesses, we have to shut down. Even businesses, the money that should be used towards production are being used to safeguard places. The, 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 uh, the kind of investment that will be coming in are no longer coming in. Look at the billions of naira that we have spent fighting Boko Haram. In the Southeast, the, another insecurity is rearing its head over there. We kept shouting about this thing when it was starting earlier, but some people felt that, oh no, allow them, let them, this one, that one, it's, it's ongoing. We can't allow people to be armed. If you leave arms in the hands of civilians, People with arms definitely will abuse it. The hundreds, the billions of dollars that have been used to fight Boko Haram, if we had used it towards uh, 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 building our nation, we would have achieved certain things. But here we are, we are spending this money on this thing and a whole lot of more are going on. And at the end of the day, markets are being affected, people's earnings are being affected, uh, businesses can't come in, businesses have, are, are having to close down in a lot of places. I am, I, 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 my business is in the agri sector agri sectors and real estate in the in the agri sector for the last was it like six seven years we've had a lot of farmers have had to close down their poultry i sell chicken feed i distribute chicken feed and they've had to close down their poultry even in kaduna kaduna i was shouting when i was shouting that there was insecurity in kaduna when i was shouting that look people were no longer living in their house because there's a place called um what's the name of this place oh, there's a particular area in Kano where they started kidnapping and at, at, uh, taking people away. But because it was a poor area, people, a lot of people ignored them. To the extent that some of them were coming to sleep. I have a housekeeper who lives near close to my house. They will have to leave their houses to come and sleep there for them to be sleep. Like people said, no, oh, that we are fake news carriers and all of that, but see where it is today. No, Nobody can take away that news. So instead of looking for one particular person that is causing the insecurity or whatever, we should look at the system of abuse we've had over the years. The Nigerian nation itself is what is causing all of this in the sense that a lot of people are not getting the education they should get. A lot of people are not getting the jobs that they should get. A lot of people are, are not being prosecuted the way they should be prosecuted. People who kill people during a riot, what happens to them? We do nothing to them. You find people who are lynching people, what happened to, to them? We do nothing to them. Somebody, they will say somebody has stolen something. They will put tire on the neck of the person. They will put, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, petrol and burn that person. Who has, how many people that partake in all of those things have been, have been prosecuted, have been sent to jail? We don't do that. So what we do is that we are breeding serial killers and who, who have gone on to keep killing. And we have all of, all of these things uh, going on. We talk about, when we look at the, uh, the insecurity, for example, 2008, the first time I heard about Boko Haram was around 2008. I was in school in Islamia, and then the mother was saying, see what is going on. They are asking people to, 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 to burn their certificates, to not go to school. They, they started as a small this thing, you know, preaching by the road. People were just looking at them and laughing and all of that. But see where they, they are today. Because what? The government did not focus. There's a man that was Jaffer, Jaffer Adams. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a man, it's an Islamic scholar that was killed in the mosque while he was praying. Yusuf, uh, Muhammad Yusuf was his, was his, uh, was his uh, what, student. And when he started this, he was like, no, what you're doing is un-Islamic. 
what you are doing, this is not the way to do it. They were having series of debates and all of that. At the end of the day, they, they killed him. When they started, when Boko Haram started, Boko Haram was focused on killing Muslims. Muslims who were going to, uh, who either had government jobs or who were in the military or who were in all of that and, and, and stuff like that. They came with the mind that, oh, they were going to fight him. They started initially, they are going to fight injustice. They are going to fight corruption. They will be the ones helping people. So, so they be the ones helping people and everything. You find out that somebody whom the government has failed, they will go and meet them, they will help them. These are, these are issues that we should tackle because the government is failing and is giving all of those uh, people who have all sorts of agenda the opportunity for them to be able to recruit more people because those people are now playing government in their lives. There are a lot of places in Nigeria today where there's no presence of government. And it is all of this... Uh, uh, terrorists and all of that, they are the ones who are acting the, the role of government in those places. Okay. I'm going to come briefly here uh, because we're running a bit out of time. Okay. Uh, and we would like to take a few questions. But I'm going to commit you to coming back on this platform. <laughs> when will you be able to come back? Because I know quite a lot of people want to ask you questions. Are you happy? Honestly, yeah. Pastor. I, 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 right now, I can't make that. Maybe that will be like next year. There's so much on my plate. You won't even believe. But it was because it was you. I just like, I, I can't say no to you, honestly. But well, yes, well, I will come back, inshallah, no problem about that. But it is not going to be anything less than either December or January. My plate okay. is amazingly full, honestly. Which, which is good, no problem. Then okay. we'll ask you a lot more questions then. Okay. But then we'll probably take three questions on this platform. Okay. Only three questions, please. Because no our time has, no is past friend. And yeah, I'm sure I'm that so you're not- sorry. A... I can speak for Africa, that's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> you've spoken for Africa and Europe together. <laughs> <laughs> and you've spoken for Nigeria very well. <laughs> But 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 I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit since no problem, you. No I was I going like to delay this, uh, uh, and then I'm going to take only three. Hello, it's frozen. Hope it's not from my side. Jones, please. No, okay, it's it frozen. I, I didn't hear what was saying. No, I can't hear you now, but I didn't hear you earlier. Okay. I'm just asking the people on the platform to raise their electronic hands. Only three questions tonight, okay. please. Okay. And then Aisha, the question Pastor, I was asking. We already I have three people. Antonio okay. Bebo, Sikiru Kayode, and um, Joseph Ogeho. Okay, Antonio Bebo, Sikiru Kayode, Joseph Ogeho, finish. We'll take only three questions today because of our time. And I will do a juro for myself and be the fourth person. Uh, and you can take my question first or last. And my question is this. Uh, if you had a list of maybe five, six, seven, eight people who you think were competent to be president of Nigeria, would you be willing to let me know your top uh, six or seven mm -hmm. people that you think will be competent to be president of Nigeria since you say you are not running? So mm -hmm. let us see the... Uh, six, seven, eight, maybe up to ten people you think are competent. <laughs> President of Nigeria. The, the problem is that if we keep waiting for these parties to give us candidates, they will give us candidates mm. that we may not like. My brother calls them Triddle D and Triddle Dump. They'll just give us two candidates that we cannot, cannot deliver the goods. And we can't run that risk anymore. I think what we need to do in Nigeria... I've already put my first candidate out there <laughs> somewhere. <like> that. <laughs> okay, all right. You know, you know, I know you very well. <laughs> you know, I know you very well. <laughs> okay, somewhere like that. Thank you. Uh, but I want you to list them yourself. I don't want someone like that to speak for you. Uh, I want you to speak for yourself. Then um, we we'll then take the questions. Antonio Gwebo, who are the other two, Sonny? Please remind me. Sikiru Kayode and Joseph Ogeho. Although okay. there's a Daniel or Molewa also, if there's time, they can all, please make the questions short and sharp. And I'm sure um, Aisha will make her responses short and sharp. We want to leave at seven. And then we, close. we want to close by seven, please. So Daniel, Ogwebo, uh, uh, please. Sonny, just call them one by one and let them ask their questions. Or mute yourself, ask your question. All right. 
Go ahead, Mr. Antonio. Okay. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. So, um, um, Aisha, thanks for your contribution. The question is, um, restructuring Nigeria, mm -hmm. uh, how, to what extent do you believe that restructuring? Because for me, I see we have different civilizations. This issue of majority minority and all that, I don't like to hear that. Majority of minority, everybody's a different civilization, you know, without going into details. But to what extent, restructuring means everybody, you know, as the founding fathers did, you know, move as best as you can in your own square area, move as best as you can, your priorities, your values, religion, whatever it is. So to what extent do you, you, do you believe that restructuring would more or less solve a lot of the problems we have? Because if some people want to go back into time, like the stock in history, God bless them. If some people want to get on board with the 21st century yeah. and make okay. progress, so you, you get it. So to what yeah, extent do you believe that restructuring is gonna help us? Thank you. Thank you, okay. Thank you very much, Anthony. Sikiru, please ask your question very quickly. Go straight to the question, please. Okay, good afternoon, um, Aisha, and good afternoon, uh, moderators, everybody. Okay, so my uh, my one is a question and one is a suggestion. Um, for the first one, we're talking about uh, vote tells our party, as uh, being said by Aisha. Um, for me, I, I know a lot of Nigerians don't uh, really like to vote, and then she has actually shared a lot of lies to it. Um, something happened in Kogi State during uh, voting where we saw people come out to vote and then uh, suddenly we started seeing uh, 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 police vans, you know, stick snatching of ballot boxes, people are running at Tasketa, people are, those who are, I mean, uh, bold enough, they're able to, you know, make videos and all that, you know. Um, these are not people who are just uh, miscrants on the street. These are organized people. These are police people. These are um, what you call, these are government agents coming out, you know, to chase people, to steal uh, ballot boxes and all that. You know, that alone has already created, you know, uh, fear in the minds of the people. And that is what is trending now in our society. Um, the second one is um, police involvement in election. I think we should have a situation where we start talking to police to be able to know that this problem we are having in this country is not only for the masses alone, but for everybody who is the citizens of this country. Now, if you're a police officer and you think because you're a police officer, you want to arrest the people, do not forget that your children are also, I mean, part of this system. You have families who are not who are in the civilian space. We need the police to, to get to know what their, their responsibility is in this country when it comes to election and all that. Okay, Thank let me you. Just quickly. We no have problem. seven minutes of seven PM. If you need me to answer this question, it's seven. We need to. No, no. Let's take one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Thank you so much. Joseph. Okay. Uh, good evening, Aisha. Good evening, first sir. Time, first time of getting close to you. I'll be willing Straight to do to this all question, my life. Joseph, Thank please. you. The question is, Aisha. Before the invasion of 1897, the British, the Great Benin Empire, and we have had Nigeria put together as a nation. Now, since 1960 to where we are now, there have been no progress in the life of every Nigerian, except those that are opportune to be in the, in the helm of affairs or that have the power instituted in their family. Now, where we are now in 21st century, and people are now agitating, that they want to go back to where how it was before 1897. So now the Igbos want to go, the Yorubas want to go, even the Great Benin Empire want to reemerge re again as a nation of their own. So why not we just go in a separate way so we can take care of ourselves instead of we trying to? Uh, the Nigeria has expired in 100 years ago. 100 years has has elapsed in 1914. So why not we now each region? go on their separate way so they can take care of themselves instead of we trying to put a sticking plaster on a breaking egg okay. that will not yield anything. Thank, thank you very much, Joseph. I shall okay. please answer those questions uh, okay. as quickly as you can in five yeah. minutes. I, I, I was, okay, so th these are all questions that are supposed to even be seminal questions on their own or, or something, but I, I will just go on. So I think I will start from the bottom. Uh, so it makes it, uh, it uh, so I would say to if in 19, if in 1897, Nigeria was doing so well, the way we, I think one of the things is that we romanticize the past too much. We feel that, oh, yesterday was better. 
just because we are suffering today, sort of working towards tomorrow. If 1897 was that good, I mean, my ancestors wouldn't have sat down for people to come all the way and come and start enslaving people. We would not have been colonized in the first place. We would have been at the pl place where everybody else was. Yes, there were, there, there were, there were kingdoms and from Edo State, and from the Kukuruku Empire in Edo state, when you're talking after the Edo, uh, the Edo Empire, the Kukuruku Empire, even when the British had dethroned the Oba of Benin, his mom came to my village because uh, Agbede, because to the Oba of, Oba of Agbede, that was really the Oba Momodu the first, because they, he thought, uh, she thought he might have come to seek uh, this thing in my place. And when they came to, uh, to our place in, uh, at Agbede, the Oba Momodu said nobody should fight them. And so there was a bit of good relationship between the white and my own uh, kingdom. To the extent the second school in that region was actually in my village. But it's in, and in Edo State, he's from Edo State, there's a saying that I too know that I make a bad shot. Because when they were bringing all of those things, uh, my own people said they didn't want a lot of the developmental things that were coming in because they didn't want their wives to be compromised, to be spoiled. The Islam was already in my, in my place and we were not. Uh, they didn't fight us to win. It was Oba Momodi himself that had brought uh, Islam into, into Agbada. So what I want us to, so I know a bit of all of those histories that I hear uh, from my parents. We pass it on uh, what, mouth to mouth. But the thing is that we must stop romanticizing all of, all of that past. It's not as if it was the best time that we ever had. But having said that, I think his question relates to the one who asked for uh, restructuring. For me, I believe whether there's restructuring, whether there's no restructuring, Nigeria can be a great nation. So for me, whatever it is Nigeria wants, let Nigeria go that way. If we want to remain as one country, let's go that way. If we want to separate into different regions or into different countries, it can be 36 countries, let us go that way. One Nigeria is not sacrosanct. What is sacrosanct is good governance, accountability, transparency, rule of law, separate, separation of power, development, uh, good road, good healthcare system, good road network system. You know, the good things of life, these are the things that are sacrosanct. It is not us staying together as one nation. So if it's restructuring we want, let us go the restructuring way. And I've said this before, I'm gonna re repeat it now. If for example, you vote, that, that's why I say to people, focus on the uh, legislative arm of government. If the people from the South, the people from the South is the people from the Southwest, the people from the middle bed, they want to restructure it. If they send it, uh, the the, the, the uh, people into the legislative arm of government, the uh, lawmakers that know this is what they are going there to pursue. We can have a restructuring in Nigeria. It is not the president that gives restructuring. The president does not have the power to give restructuring. It is the legislative arm, the National Assembly and the State Houses of Assemblies that we give restructuring. Even if the president refused to assent to the bill, they can override him. It takes two thirds. And if they fight for it, they can't get it. So we shouldn't wait and say, oh, it's one person we are waiting for. When, when people are talking about restructuring, what I say to them is that what region is working in Nigeria today? What makes you think that when we now break into different regions, that that's what we now make Nigeria to work? There was a problem. We were all regional. There was a reason why we came to, 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 to the kind of federalism that we have today. Because there are a lot of people who are marginalized in that region. I'm from Edo State. I am a minority in Edo State. I am a Muslim. I'm from Esapo. And so, and like somebody said, I am a minority amongst the minority. We never talk about this thing. In those regions, when we had the Eastern region and all of that, there were people who were minorities, who were not seen as being capable, of, and they became effective when it became to the when it became a federal system. So we need to look, uh, look uh, into that. For me personally, I totally believe we can have a devolved power, just like what UK has. The Englishman and the Irishman, the Scottish man and all of that, the Welsh, they are not, they are not, they are not, they don't see eye to eye. They don't even, they don't even want to be related. If you even mistake one for the other, they are ready to call you out and say, no, they are not. In short, Welsh in Wales was, uh, was um, forbidden for over 500 years. Imagine somebody's language. They didn't allow it. It was last century. It was in the, in the 20th century that they now made uh, Welsh it could be lawful for somebody to speak Welsh in Wales. So people in marginalization, whatever it is that you think about it, people have gone through it a lot. But what, they, what have they been able to do? They have devolved powers. So Scotland is acting on its own on certain things. UK, England is having acting on its own. Wales, uh, Wales is acting on its only Northern Ireland that still have problems once in a while. Sometimes they shut down their national assembly because they're always fighting. 
they shut down their assembly, their legislative, and they suspend it from time. And what do they do? They all meet at a particular place. They have their uh, devolved powers. They act on certain things. They take their make rules on certain things. There are certain things that they don't make rules or when it comes to immigration, uh, it comes to uh, Convert, any conversions and all of that. There are certain things that they do not make rules of. So we can do something like that. Let everybody now work at their own level and the way that the, the, the first speaker spoke, spoke about, then people can do what they, they want to do without waiting for anybody. So it's not necessarily breaking. But at the end of the day, what I want us to talk about, to always put in mind is that if we are devolving, we start solving the political issues, we have, we have solving the leadership issue we have, will we still devolve these people that have heard us run from? They are all from the different regions of Nigeria. They will only break down and continue oppressing us. So let people not romanticize and think that, oh, the moment we have restructuring, everything will be okay. No, we still have to do the work. We can be great with restructuring. We can be great with our restructuring. It all depends on whatever we choose uh, to do, and we can get that. Night. So for me, I'm from restructuring and for one Nigeria, whichever one it is. And if people want restructuring, let's begin to send to the National Assembly people uh, people that would not make us that we go there and talk at the talk of restructuring and not just go there and be collecting a few uh, dollars for them to be able to pass uh, certain uh, uh, bills. So coming back to a uh, voter's apathy that, uh, that, that, that somebody talked about, the stealing of ballot boxes and all of that, it's really a sad occurrence. And one of the things I always want people to realize, which people always forget because we are so quick at romanticizing the past is that militarization of uh, election actually started not during this administration, last administration. If you remember Ekiti 2014, there was militarization of election. I think that was during the time of Brigadier General Momo, where they went, they sent in military, they arrested opposition leaders, they arrested people, uh, even governors that were coming into Ekiti state were not allowed to enter Ekiti state. That was during the period when Adam Soshomale, who was then governor from my state, Edo State, was stopped from flying. And so Nigerian government, we have a situation where when people get into the office, they abuse the offices. And one of the things we must do is to strengthen our institutions so that the president does not have the right to actually abuse our offices the way we see. We saw what happened in, in the United States and how their military came out to say that they do not have allegiance to anybody. We must get to that thing where we, where we, are, doing, uh, where we are doing that. And we must, people, we must defend our votes. That's one of the things that we must say. And the more people come out, the less the police are able to do things. And then I will just uh, round up to say that. Uh, uh, Pastor, yeah. you actually put me in a very, very serious spot. Uh, uh, Top of my head, one of the things that I'm very poor at is names of people. So, um, and I would say to you, my husband will always say this: Aisha before 2014 and Aisha 20, uh, after 2014. Before 2014, I wasn't. I really don't know many people. I really don't know a lot of people there. So there are amazing people out there who can be president that I might not be the ones uh, 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 to, to, to know them. But top of my head, like somebody did say, obvious equestrian is one person that's top of uh, top of top of my head, and and that's one person that I know. But then. Only one person cannot make president. So I have people like Peter Obitu. For me, it's a, if, the, if the 2019 was shifted, how can you make him vice president? Nah, that doesn't work again. People like Jega, people like Okoja Iwela, they are Femi uh, Fala. Now there are so many people. Uh, and and uh, oh, oh my goodness. If I don't say this name, my Lagos Business School, what's his name? What's his name? Uh, Pat Tommy. <laughs> God, Pat. So uh, my problem is the names, honestly. There are so many other names that I can I can tell you top of my head are there that can be presidents at the time. And the thing is that when they become president, we will hold them accountable. But right now at this moment, one of the reasons when Dr. Obvious Ekotilis dropped down from the presidential election, one of the things she said was the fact that, look, even if she becomes president today, <laughs> with the kind of system that we had, nothing was going to ha uh, happen because we needed a strong uh, uh, legis uh, legislative and we needed a uh, strong political uh, people that have voted into office. And so she decided that with the system that you had, things were not going to work. We need to begin to produce leaders. And that was where she did, uh, started on her work on the work she's doing, Fixed Politics, and we shall started a school called the School of uh, Politics, Policy, uh, Policies and Governance, the SPPG, and they're training people to be, to be leaders because we need people that will understand what it takes. People just think governance is just to go there. No, it's not. When I see people telling me I shall come and be president, I say, people, okay, what do I know? I don't have what it takes to actually be president. I don't have the competence, but it doesn't mean that 
I will not be able to get that confidence. And that's one of the things I'm working on now. Like I said to myself, the next 10 years, 2021 to 2031, is all about, about self-development for me. And probably when people ask me in 2031, whether I want to run for, uh, for president or any position, I'll be able to tell them yes or no, not because of my capacity, maybe just because I want to, or I do not want to. Thank you so much uh, for having me. And I'm sorry, there's so many names that I should have mentioned in the list, but I'm very poor with names. I can see their faces, but I can't even remember their names. Thank you so much, Pastor for having me today. And thank you everybody for listening. Thank you very much, Aisha. Thank you, you've done very, very well. And honestly, we're gonna bring you back. So you walk out with us a date in December no. or January, uh, and then we'll talk a bit more deeply and we'll have time for a lot more questions. And then I will call you personally to have some small personal discussion here and there, and okay. also get from you some of the names of the faces that you can see, but you can't remember the names. Okay. You know, because uh -huh. we just have to try and make Nigeria work and mm. try and put our best foot forward. My really warm regards to your husband, my salutations to him for allowing you to be yourself. And it's this my is mentor. something in, my uh, mentor. I, I like to ask you about he's my mentor, he's my teacher, he's my backbone. I mean, amazing, amazing, honestly. Oh, wow. top, of my, top of my heart for him. He's, he's an amazing human being and he's always about my progress. I mean, he met me when I was still in school and I, everything. He has been my teacher since then and he still is. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. I look forward to meeting him also. Maybe yes. he'll be my teacher also. So that... <laughs> Thank you, sir. So at least we have, we have one thing in common. We have the same teacher. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you, sir. My regards to your children, my prayer for your son Amen. and all those who surround you that the Lord will heal, the Lord will strengthen, the Lord Amen. will bless, and the Amen. Lord will enlarge your coast, protect you Amen. to fulfill your purpose, Amen. and protect Nigeria to be great again. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. I want to thank everybody for being here, and I do know that you've all had a wonderful time. Aisha, God bless you. And Amen. And you too, sir. Thank you so much for what you're doing. This is amazing. This is the kind of religious leadership we are asking for. Not the ones that will tell us to go home and pray. The ones that will go tell us to pray. pray and work because they say faith without work is dead. So thank you so much, sir. It's all right. But we we'll still go home and pray. We have to make Nigeria work. I'm Absolutely. determined that we will make Nigeria work and I'll do my very best. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone I'm not, I'm for your not, time. I'm not afraid. Me. And we must not be Thank afraid. You. We must not be afraid. Absolutely. We must not be afraid. Amen. We encourage you not to be afraid. Nah. And then we'll make it work. Thank you. We have to pay the my, price. You have to make a sacrifice. God's in hands and it's not in anybody's hands. So I'm not going to be afraid of anybody. I'm going to live my life the way it is and it's only going to be according to what God has said, not what man has said. Thank you so much. Wow. Sacrifice. We all need to make the sacrifice. Absolutely. We will. Thank, Absolutely. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Amen. God bless you too. Thank you. Good night. Mr. Thank Dada, you. thank you very much for making the connection. Bye. Thank you. Awesome. God bless. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. God bless everybody. Well done. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, Pastor Itwa. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Uncle Ephraim. Thank you, Pastor Itwa. Thank you, Aisha. Thank God. Thank, thank you. you.